I got onto the left hand wing, clambering over that door lip, and then I stood onto the wing and was able to stand on the wing momentarily. I jumped, um, I would estimate, at a height of about 15, 15 feet. going to Luton Airport uh, back in the day and I was just a kid and you could get quite close to the activity. You'd hear the, uh, the pilots kind of doing the engine tests and, and throttling down the runway down that centre line and the, the noise, the smell of the, uh, the kerosene coming off the back of the aircraft and you know the desire to perhaps uh, learn to fly myself one day was perhaps born dur during that time. What was that like? I'd been with an instructor for about three weeks duration uh, I had a couple of different instructors during that time and everything was going very well. And then I'd been solo for around about eight days. It was one of those bluebird days. You know, the sun was, was shining down on me. You know, birds in the trees kind of twittering. And I was just thinking about what was, what was coming ahead. As far as I was concerned, it was just another day solo and I was kind of hour building, building up my experience. And then I would have been coming back to the UK, uh, sort of job done, sort of tick in the box and that ambition complete, as it were. Nice and calm, nice and gentle, hand on the stick, and then I go full throttle, and I'm starting to take off, and I'm starting to head um, higher, and then once I get to a 1,000 feet, I can pull back gently on the throttle and sort of level off, so the, the aircraft sort of goes from climbing to sort of leveling off, 1,000 feet, and then I can kind of gently kind of cruise around in the pattern and do, and do what I need to do. I then did a, a look, and I did a look again, because I couldn't quite believe what I saw. I was struck by an immediate um, vision, if you will, of a thin streak of visible yellow-orange flame. And I had to look again because it was a, it was a shock initially. And, um, and I realized that it was fire, and it was a thin streak, and it was emanating from the front portion of the fuselage. And I looked down at my feet on the rudder pedals, um, I could see flame starting to lap and around the feet and the ankles inside the, uh, the chamber of the small two-seater cockpit that I'm sat in. And I thought immediately, Christ, this is no drill. This is for real, this is an emergency. And I've got to get this aircraft down. I immediately felt the heart sort of boom, boom, boom within my chest. You know, there I was at a thousand feet, what, nowhere to go. Where am I gonna go? You can't jump from that height. Uh, people have asked me, you know, did you not have a parachute? Well, you don't wear a parachute in a, a light aircraft. I was under no illusion that if I didn't get out of that burning cockpit quickly that um, the likelihood was I wasn't going to make it, I was going to be a goner. And that fire would, would have certainly overwhelmed me and, um, and, 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 and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have, you know, lived to tell the tale. The only option I foresaw was indeed to, to, to try to, to get out of that cockpit early, but I needed to get her the, the aircraft that was to a safe level in order to to have any you know chance of, of pulling that off cleanly and, and, and make it happen. My mind then flicked back to one of the US instructors and I can distinctly remember it and he said and I quote above all if there's an emergency and you've got a problem fly the damn aircraft and these words kind of echoed and reverberated in, in my in my memory and I and I thought I've got to I've got to hold on I've got to get a grip here and I've got to do exactly that so I kept my left hand on the uh, the flight control stick and my right hand on the throttle and I carefully just knocked off that power on the throttle to try to reduce airspeed and I needed to reduce that significantly in order to get myself to a, a relatively safe speed approaching the active runway. All the time I'm watching the altimeter spin down, so through 900 feet, 800 feet, 700 feet, 600 feet, and I've got that left hand on control, right hand on the throttle, and I'm trying to breathe and I'm trying to think through it, and I'm just trying to really calm it all down as much as possible. When I flew over the top of the active runway, I was literally 100 feet, 50 feet by the time I'd cleared it. I turn off the key, Magneto's Alpha Bravo, the red switch is off. In the center column, fuel pump off. Rotate 
fuel selector valve through 90 degrees off everything off 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 in sequence the, at the lower at the lower reaches at, from at 50 feet um, and below the fire was literally lapping my face uh, that hand on the control stick the right hand on the throttle and I was literally <laughs> in a vain bid, if you will, to protect my airway from flame ingress. I then opened my left-hand canopy door. I can remember reaching across, fiddling with the, um, the handle. I then had to elbow it with my left elbow and punch it and strike it with the heel of my hand. And I'm now 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, 20 feet, all the time looking, checking, looking. And at 20 feet, I got onto the left-hand wing, clambering over that door lip. And then I stood onto the wing. I was able to stand on the wing momentarily, uh, but I had the backwash of the prop, which is why I have this uh, really aggressive sort of right side dominant burn. And that affected my, my scalp, as you can see, my right shoulder uh, down the right-hand side of my lower limb. My left side was, was uh, significantly protected and that's, uh, um, was burned but it's indeed a lot healthier and uh, so I jumped um, I would estimate at a height of about 15 one five feet in reality I was probably traversing at about perhaps 30 knots through the airspace and that height 15 feet so it was a it was a tremendously hard impact even though I landed feet first I then thrust forward I smashed my face on the uh, on the sharp Florida razor grass below and I remember my right shoulder was still on fire, so I aggressively had to pat it out. And my right scalp, I could sense it was still on fire, so I patted it out. The aircraft carried on on a very low and shallow traje trajectory without me, and I watched her uh, crash land. There was this ugly, crumpling, crashing noise, and extremely loud and, and very scary. And all of a sudden, boom, an almighty explosion. I felt the shock of the explosion, the energy come through me and back again. And that sucked out uh, all of the air that uh, I had within the lung. And the heat in the inferno was indescribable. It was intense. And it was at that moment when the pain hit me for the very first time. And the only way I can describe that, it was like a tsunami of pain that washed over me from head to toe. Every uh, aspect of, of nerve and sinew was struck by this pain and I, I just cannot describe the intensity of that. I had a uh, facial fracture so I inadvertently ruptured my, my, uh, my nose bone. I had bilateral superorbital eye socket fractures on both sides from the impact. Um, also the force from the jump and the landing uh, travelled through my torso area. Uh, little did I realise that I'd um, ruptured my large intestine so the colon and it also lacerated my liver internally which was now hemorrhaging and bleeding very profusely internally. I was 63% third degree burns and that came to light uh, later on with the, um, the medical diagnosis. I'm starting to grow colder and weaker with every second that was passing. So I then decided that um, it wasn't going to be long, that I didn't have long uh, to, to go, to, to survive here. So I then took my shoes and socks off. I'm not even sure uh, what the reason for that was. I just figured um, in my rationale that this was clearly one journey that I didn't need my shoes and socks for. Typical soldier, you know, I wanted that order right to the very end. And I lay the shoes and socks on the right hand side and I just put them neatly by the side of me. And um, I held on and I don't know how I did it. Um, all I can suggest is that I was a young man at the time you know I was just turned 32 years of age and I was as fit as a butcher's dog by virtue of what I did for a living uh, you know with the forces and um, I kept myself in in great shape and so I, I guess I had that fighting edge but I still didn't have long and I waited and and then I heard the sirens so it was like woo 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 and then the truth is um, I don't remember anything for, for realistically the next six months of my life. The doctors in Orlando gave me about a 5% probability of survival, which is extremely slim odds. Even though they placed me in drug-induced coma, I was in the fight of my life. I mean, this was Jamie Hull 
you know, World War Three. To give you an indication, um, thankfully, because of the insurance that I was backed up by, um, the bill in America came to some 2.6 million US dollars, uh, and that was only for a round about four month period. I had 62 operations under general anesthetic with uh, um, a multitude of different surgeons uh, for all kinds of different reconstructive work uh, following the burns and to get me back on track, to get me back to a semblance of health and normality. And indeed, I had many years of work, both physically and mentally, in order to accept and in order to rehabilitate myself It was very important for me to get back in the air somehow and to fulfill that ambition all over again and to, uh, to keep going. I did fortunately uh, um, win a scholarship to learn to fly a hot air balloon and I did my training in Italy. It gave me that real sem that sense of freedom. Admittedly, you know, what I do with a balloon from time to time is a lot more sedate, but then I guess the new version of Jamie Hull is a lot more sedate, you know, I'm not that high-speed guy that I once was, and so it's probably quite fitting, really. <laughs>